All right. Class is back in session. I'm Tom Sharp, and I'm going to be the uh, lecturer for this next 45 minute period where we're going to talk about functional annotation of metagenomic data. Can those of you in the back hear me okay if I speak with just my naked voice? Perfect. Um, so I'm from Oregon State University, uh, and I love microbiomes. Um, I love my I microbiomes so much that I spend pretty much, uh, I don't know, 16 hours a day thinking about them on average. Uh, and the way I think about them is a little different than how many other people think about them. And you're going to hear about some of those differences today, um, couched within the larger theme of functional annotation. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, the process of functional annotation somewhat at a high level. Um, but before I do that, I want to make sure that we're all sufficiently motivated uh, for this discussion. So uh, let's just really quickly summarize uh, kind of the main objectives of today's lecture. Um, I'd like to um, provide some rationale, some justification as, why, as to why you might want to think about the functional capabilities of microbiomes in a general sense. We'll also talk about some high-level theory underlying how we functionally annotate metagenomes to impute these capabilities. And then I'll also run through a series of methodological considerations that you should be aware of if, if you ever want to take on this approach yourself. But before I get started, maybe I can see a show of hands. Who here has ever worked with shotgun metagenomic data? Fair number of you. That's fantastic. So you know how messy, how cumbersome it can be, how computationally mind-numbing things can be from time to time, trying to grapple with all of this different data. So in the background of all of our considerations of various aspects of the technical approach that we apply to our discussion of shock and metagenomic data, we've also got to think about con considerations of throughput. These are huge volumes of data that we're, um, we're challenged with analyzing. We'll get to more of that um, in just a moment. But to ensure that everyone in the room is sufficiently oriented, um, forgive me for those of you who are aware of this, forgive me for being pedantic. I just want to remind you that microbiomes are interesting to think about. They're these microbial communities, diverse and generally abundant in many aspects of the biosphere. And you can literally find them just about everywhere in nature. There's a, you'll be hard pressed to find a surface or fluid that is not covered with or full of microscopic organisms. And in these different ecosystems, these organisms play important roles in shaping the environment of the ecosystem. Consider the role of photosynthetic microorganisms that produce a significant bulk of the carbon that enters the biosphere. Consider those microorganisms that grow in association with plant roots that fix nitrogen so the plant can acquire the nitrogen it requires to grow to produce the crop yield that we use to feed the world. Um, you probably uh, are well aware at this point of the human microbiome, the diverse consortia of microorganisms that live in and on our bodies and play an important role in influencing our physiologies. These are all aspects or different ways that the microorganisms that live and reside in these communities can influence their environments. So we as a field have had this interest in understanding how microbiomes interact with their environments. Can we tease out the, the, the procedures through which they're inter interacting or coordinating with their environments to influence and shape those environments. Now, a lot of what we've done so far has focused on who is there. Uh, we've asked questions like, how does a taxonomic composition of the microbiome vary across conditions? Which taxa are linked to specific environmental conditions using sort of like a correlation analysis? Maybe those are key candidate taxa for then um, empirically testing their effect on an environmental condition of interest. As sort of a case study illustration, let's consider inflammatory bowel disease. You may know somebody in your life that has one of these chronic autoimmune uh, diseases where the immune system gets, goes crazy, becomes um, a haywire antagonistic agent, and attacks the body's own tissue in the intestinal tract. These can be debilitating, they can kill people in some instances, and we don't fully understand the mechanisms that cause these diseases. So uh, for a while now, some very clever researchers have been analyzing the microbial communities that reside in the human gut to determine if specific members of the microbiome are causing these diseases to emerge or affecting the severity of these diseases. And this is a principal component analysis that we see from a great paper that came out back in 2009. It's actually referenced in the morning talk on metagenomics. Um, that showed that the kinds of taxa that reside in the gut um, associate very strongly with the health state of the individual. Are they healthy? Or do they have one of two different types of um, autoimmune diseases? Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis? And this was illuminating amongst other um, related types of studies because it tells us that there's at least a shift in the kinds of organisms that reside in the gastrointestinal tract. And that shift probably indicates that the microbiome is also doing something different. There's selection taking place. 
What's the selection actually acting on is not necessarily a Latin name, but a set of functions that these organisms are executing. And so if we want to drill a little bit deeper and understand the relationship between the kinds of organisms that reside in an environment and how they're interfacing with the environmental conditions, whether it's the amount of light that the ocean is receiving or the health state of a host, we probably want to dig in and try to resolve specific functional pathways that coordinate these interactions. And so we've seen that we're seeing the field move in this direction now towards a perspective of what the microbiome is doing in addition to understanding who is there. Can we define the functional processes that the microbiome executes that relate to environmental conditions under the premise that some of those functional processes could be contributing to the observed environmental conditions that we, um, uh, we, we see in our system? This allows us to define a mechanistic view of microbiomes. We might ask questions like, how do the biological functions of the microbiome vary across environments? Which functions link to specific environmental conditions? How does the manipulation of the microbiome's function impact an environmental condition? To give you an example of the kinds of analyses that we can conduct when asking these sorts of questions, we see here something similar to what I showed you on the, the last slide, except instead of looking at a PCA of taxa, that are found in an individual's gut. I'm showing you a, a, a non-metric dimensional uh, scaling plot of the diversity of functions that are encoded in the metagenome. What this shows us is that people who are healthy harbor microorganisms in their guts that tend to encode different kinds of genes in their genomes than individuals who elicit Crohn's disease and autoimmune disease. Now that's interesting, but we can take it a step further. And we can resolve specific functional pathways that are encoded in the microbiome that tend to relate to the health state of the host. And here you see two of many that are related to Crohn's disease, lipid A biosynthesis and um, glycosaminoglycan degradation pathways. I show you these two because empirical work aligns with what we're seeing in the functional annotations of the metagenomes that have been pulled out of these patient populations. Lipid A is a pro-inflammatory compound that certain microorganisms to secrete and has been shown to play a role in intestinal inflammation. Glycosaminoglycans, it's a mouthful to say, uh, glycosaminoglycans are integral components of the mucosa. And those microorganisms that degrade GAGs, as they're, as they're called, have often been shown to play a role in the promotion of inflammatory bowel disease severity at the very least. So we can we, we can seek to identify these types of functional linkages between the genetic um, composition of a microbiome and an environmental state of the community to better understand the potential mechanisms through which the microbiome and the environment are coordinating. But how do we do it? Well, there's actually a litany of different procedures that we can implement. Um, they all hold a lot of value. Um, I, I show you a series of them on uh, this particular slide just to kind of give you a flavor of the different approaches that folks are using in this space. All the way from culture-based investigations, we might do genetic manipulation of a micro, microbiome um, uh, model like E. coli, um, all the way down to full-scale metabolomics where we're actually determining what types of metabolites are being produced by the microbial community and maybe even testing specific metabolites on an environment of interest. Now, what I'm about to show is maybe not exactly precise, but I think it's a reasonable, um, it's, it's a reasonable ordering of uh, priority across these different procedures, um, at least in terms of general trends. From top to bottom, we tend to find that the, the various approaches um, provide more direct measures of overall community function. All right, so if you're just doing, for example, culture-based investigations, you might really be able to intimately discern one particular microbe's um, functional capacity, but you might miss all the other functional um, properties of the community writ large. If you come all the way down to metabolomics, you're going to get a really nice, reasonable readout of what types of metabolites are actively being produced by the community. For our, um, our, our consideration, at least in my group, we tend to focus a lot on metagenomes because they offer a relatively comprehensive insight into the microbiome's functional capacity. And that's a really important phrase. Metagenomes don't tell us what's actively being produced. Right? It's not transcriptional, it's not proteomic, it's just genetic. But um, what we can determine is whether or not the types of functions that are encoded in the genomes of the organisms that comprise these communities tend to associate with ecological covariates. 
And in so doing, we can get a sense of what functions might matter to the ecosystem. For those of you who have never generated metagenomic data or are still wrapping your head around what it might be, uh, I'll um, ask you to turn your attention to this slide. Here we see the high level view of how metagenomic data is produced. We start with a community of organisms and we extract all the DNA from all the different cells. This produces a milieu of genomes. We might have a thousand different species that comprise our community, and now we've extracted all of their DNA simultaneously. We're then going to sh conduct shotgun sequencing where we chop the genomes up into small fragments, sequence them, and what we'll end up with is an alphabet soup of short DNA sequencing reads. These reads are randomly distributed across the length of the genome, as shown in blue lines in the cartoon behind me, for the myriad genomes present in the community. Now, some of these reads are going to align to taxonomically diagnostic loci, like 16S, which you heard about in a great lecture earlier today. Other reads are going to um, be sampled from genes that might encode functions for which we know something, like nitrate reductase in the left-hand um, red box. And so what we can do then is we can mine these metagenomes to look for reads that are homologs of described functional pathways. And in so doing, characterize the functional diversity or annotate the functional capacity of the metagenome. Now, there are a couple of different strategies that people have implemented to do this. Um, today, we're going to talk about the one at the top of this list, annotation through homology. It's probably the simplest approach, the most straightforward, and probably the most widely used. There's some important considerations that we have to think about when we conduct functional annotation through homology inference. But you should be aware that there are um, excellent tools that are emerging such as the detection of gene variants present in uh, various integrated gene catalogs. This works really well when you have a system whose metagenome is very well covered by publicly available data, like the human gut. Basically, we've described all the known genes that we've seen in every human who's had a metagenome sequenced, and you can determine which of those genes that have been previously described are in your human sample. Um, you can also determine the functional capacity through genome assembly. Um, the challenge here, of course, is that genome assembly tends to be restricted to relatively abundant members of the microbiome, and you may miss important functional aspects of your community if you've biased your analysis just to those. So to talk about annotation through homology, I just want to do a quick whirlwind through what homology is and why it is a useful resource for thinking about functional inference. Anybody who's worked with functional annotation of genomes is going to recognize a lot of what I'm about to talk about. So just to remind you, Genes evolve. Presumably, there's no debate about that in this particular audience. Um, and what we see on the right-hand side of this um, phylogenetic tree are a series of extant sequences that are all related through common ancestor, and consequently, they're homologs. Um, and these uh, related sequences are all thought to retain relatively consistent functions, because they all diverged from a sequence that originated with a, a very precise and uh, specific function. There might be variation in the precision of the functions across these different homologs, but generally speaking, the, um, the overall function that, uh, the, the high level uh, general function that we might see for one homolog could tend to be applied or transferred to other members of the family in a general sense. So once we know one family member's function, we can reasonably discern the function of its homologs. So then if we have new sequences, we can use alignment-based procedures to discern, in just one second, to discern what functions might be associated with our new sequences of interest. Yes? So there's some debate about whether or not we want to look at, say, a homology across the entire length of a gene, or if we want to look for specific domains homologous domains. Um, generally speaking, homology tends to be imputed through global, uh, for uh, through a, a, effectively a global gene alignment between two different sequences. Um, but that's not the only way that function can be imputed. Often, if you might use the PFAM database, for example, which is an extensive database of protein domains, which are subregions within a DNA sequence, or rather a protein sequence, and the aggregation of different domains that are detected in a sequence can provide you some inference of functional capacity. Yeah, it's a good question. There is debate about it. Um, for the purposes of this discussion, we're going to be thinking about, principally speaking, um, full-length um, uh, sequences, but that's going to change pretty rapidly when we get into metagenomic data. Um, here, we're, we're looking at um, a schematic that illustrates how functional annotation might occur. And we're going to start with some referential information. This is a database like PFAM, or maybe KEG, 
or seed. These are other terms that you've heard thrown around uh, at least today, where we have um, families of sequences that researchers have previously identified. These are sequences within a boundary that corresponds to a container that is a family, where researchers have previously identified these family members are homologs of one another. So what we can then do is we've got a new genome, for example, and we've got four genes on our genome. The colors correspond to sequences that are derived from geno the red genome, the blue genome, the black genome. Okay? So these tend to be based on whole genomic data that somebody else has previously aggregated for us. Well, they could be copies. They could be, they're paralogs. Basically, they're paralogs, right? Two genes that are related through common descent in the same genome. Exactly. So now we've got our green genome. It's the world's smallest genome, four genes. And we want to know, are any of these genes homologs of the protein families that we've seen previously? So what do we do? We take each of these different genes and we use a sequence-based, uh, an alignment-based procedure to determine if the protein, we're going to translate that gene sequence, if the protein of that gene manifests a significant meaningful alignment with any of the proteins in the, in the different um, protein families that we have um, in our database. So it's an all versus all comparison, A versus each and every single one of those lines. And what we'll then do is we'll determine using the alignment um, criteria if A is a member of any one of those different families. And we do that for each and every single protein. We might end up with something that looks like this. Here our protein families have been expanded to include the new gene sequences that have been classified into the protein families. You'll note, not all proteins will end up in a family. D might be a novel protein we've never seen before, and we have no place to put it. And it does not get included in most downstream analyses when people apply these types of procedures. It's an important caveat to be aware of. Novel genes present a problem for the general approach we're talking about here. Your metagenome will definitely have novel genes, assuming you're looking at something that's kind of not human. Once we've got these different um, uh, classifications, we can then impute at least high-level functions for the different sequences. A and C happen to be in a family for which we know something about the fa that particular family's function. That's great. We can make some imputation about what these genes might be doing. Protein B, however, may not actually be a, mem it might be a member of a family for which we have no described function. It happens a lot. It's a frustratingly frequent occurrence. Um, and again, D is unclassified, so oftentimes it just gets ignored, depending on the analysis that's occurring. So this is what we do when we have whole genome sequences, and we have whole genes. This is an easy problem, relatively speaking. What about when we have metagenomic data? Everything's randomly shotgun sequenced. We don't necessarily have whole genes. Well, we can apply the same approach, and we're going to talk about some caveats and considerations that have to be thought through carefully. But basically, we take our DNA sequencing reads, which might be short, they might be fragmented, they might be randomly distributed along the length of a gene, they might be selected from non-coding sequences. We don't know. We're going to translate them using some sort of technique, take whatever proteins we predict in those um, the fragmented metagenomic sequences, and apply them to the exact same homology search procedure. And in so doing, determine which reads are members of which particular families, and consequently impute the functions that are encoded by those reads. Uh, yes, basically right. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little more depth in a few slides, but you've got it. The, the, the comment was, so we're taking all open reading frames and basically attempting to functionally annotate them the way we would a genome. That's right. So uh, that sounds simple, but it turns out it's um, a pain in the rear um, for a, very, a, a couple of different reasons. First, we have to decide if we want to assemble the data or not. Right? We also have to determine if we, uh, how we should translate the reads into protein sequences. How do we predict ORPs in a metagenomic sequence? What if you've randomly sampled a sequence in the middle of a gene, you got no start, you got no stop? How do you determine that? That's tough. What parameters should we adopt to discern homology? I basically just said you're going to find homologs, and I've waved my magic hands. But you actually have to think about how you're going to determine if something's a homolog or not. And then how do we do it efficiently? You're probably going to generate for one sample in a metagenome millions of reads, millions of reads. Many, maybe even more. And you might generate many different metagenomes. So how do you do this in a way that's actually efficient if you consider the size of the protein family databases that we tend to look at, which themselves have many millions of protein sequences encoded in them? This is a computational nightmare, unless you are sitting on a supercomputer and no one else happens to be using it. 
So for those who didn't hear the question, it was, once you've produced the functional annotations, what do they look like? Really comes down to the specific protein family reference database that you're using. In um, most practical applications, the matrix that is produced is actually some archaic uh, protein family number, like eggnog 0001076, which doesn't mean anything to us um, in terms of human readability, but tells us that this is a classified unit that the read was put into. There's usually then a lookup table that we have access to that we can, if, if depending again on the protein family database we're looking at, that allows us to have some information about what the function of that container happens to be. I like working in KEG because KEG doesn't just give us protein families that have human readable annotations, but it links those protein families into metabolic modules and those metabolic modules into functional pathways. So we get information at various levels of resolution and basically a hierarchy. But again, depends on the space in which you're going to annotate. It's a good question. With that being said, you usually get a matrix of gene families by samples with you have, where you have some sort of abundance, um, maybe a normalized abundance, but it's some sort of count uh, that tells you how many copies of that gene family you found in that sample. So having identified these different um, pain points, um, we conducted an analysis a little while ago where we used a simulation-based procedure to try to answer some of these questions that were pressed, plaguing the field. And what we basically did is we took reference genomes um, and we constructed mock communities where we had whole genome sequences and we weighted the abundance of these genomes based upon taxonomic profile from re real metagenomes we'd seen previously in published literature. We then took those mock communities and we used whole genome sequences to annotate all the genes in those genome sequences using a, a, a variety of different protein family databases. But we can just say keg for now because we did it in that analysis, in that space. And then what we did is we quantified an expected family abundance, which is basically that matrix that I just described. We took the same mock communities and we simulated metagenomic libraries by taking this tool called Grindr and basically chopping all the genomes up into things that look like metagenomic reads. They have distributions along the length of the genome that simulate what you see in a, in a classical metagenome. And we took those simulated metagenomes and we annotated them using the exact same protein family database and we applied a variety of different annotation thresholds to produce an estimated family abundance and that we can then evaluate by comparing our estimated family abundance to the expected family abundance how different annotation thresholds affect annotation accuracy. Standard kind of stuff. Family proteins, you've got it. So one question that we grappled with was how do we efficiently predict genes in metagenomic data? How do you find the ORPs? This slide illustrates the complexity of the problem. On the far left, we have a metagenome. We actually have several different metagenomes, a red, a blue, and a purple. And for each read in these different metagenomes, um, we have to discern whether or not there are genes present in it. So what you see shown in the center column, or excuse me, the second uh, column to the left, is one read that um, starts with a coding sequence that ends in a stop codon, as indicated by the star. And then, as we move down the length of the read, we see a start codon. All right? So there are actually two ORFs in this toy example shown on this particular uh, metagenomic read, but they're both partial. So what we then do is we take those ORFs, right, those translated sequences, and we, con we conduct the protein family classification that I just mentioned with those translated sequences. It's important that whatever gene prediction tool we use predicts genes accurately because we don't want to have spurious annotations emerge that can complicate our downstream imputations. So, yeah, absolutely. as opposed to, say, gene-based alignment. So you could do the same procedure or related procedure with gene sequences. The reason we like to do it at the protein level is because a lot of the gene family databases do not necessarily encapsulate a phylogenetic breadth of protein sequences that might represent your community. So imagine that you've got, for example, um, some lineages of, of uh, microorganisms that are relatively novel on the phylogenetic tree of life. Now, you might have genome sequences that um, sort of in, encompass that lineage, but it's relatively isolated from all the others. If you do this analysis of the DNA sequence, you may not be able to detect homology between your imputed genes and the genes we've seen in those other genomes previously. 
But because there's greater conservation due to degenerate code, et cetera, at the protein level, we can better improve our ability to resolve homology at the protein sequence level. So um, fortunately for us, we didn't have to invent a gene prediction tool for metagenomic data. Smarter, better, cleverer people did this already. Um, and so what we did is we assessed how a variety of this, these different gene annotation tools um, that can be applied to metagenomic data um, work in terms of their, uh, their ability to accurately impute the functional capacity of the microbiome. Um, there are a couple different strategies you can in, in implement. Naive six frame translation, where you just take the sequence and you translate in all six frames and then you let BLAST tell you which is the likely homolog. But what you see here on the, the y-axis is the fraction of total sequence length that you produce using these different annotation procedures. Six frame translation gives you a lot of translated protein sequence data. And you do not want to get in the habit, if you can avoid it, of doing an all versus all comparison with any more sequence data than you have to because it's already computationally cumbersome. These other tools, Prodigal, FragGene Scan, and Metagene Mark, do a pretty good job of reducing the total amount of sequence information that you then have to go and compare against your protein family database. But here's the question. How accurately do they perform? Do they actually give you imputations or gene predictions that are going to be useful for your final imputation of functional um, inference? So we quantified this. We basically use six frame translation as a gold standard because that's kind of the best that you can do. It's got all the information, right? and things are going to shake out. Um, and what we see is that for relatively short read lengths, um, six frame translation absolutely outperforms in terms of the total error of the gene um, family abundances that you end up making um, compared to the other um, gene prediction tools. But as you increase gene length, prodigal um, and frag gene scan tend to do a pretty good job. We, st we do see that there's um, an increased um, amount of error in metagene mark until we get to about 250 base pairs in length. So for conventional Illumina sequencing on the high seq 3000, 101 base pairs in length, I guess it's now 150 base pairs in length, you do a pretty good job implementing these gene prediction algorithms that massively reduce the amount of sequence data that you actually have to compare. Yeah, so, well, so some of us have been talking about potential KMER statistics that could be implemented here. Um, yeah, we, I mean, and KMER statistics are implemented in um, FRAG gene scan, I believe, but I, I can't remember, recall offhand if Prodigal is necessarily using that. Um, maybe we can sideline and dig into those details a little bit more since there's more to cover in this lecture. Okay, so we can, inf we can efficiently predict genes and metagenomic data, but there's some caveats I want you to be aware of. The first is that what we're doing here in these summary statistics that I'm giving you in terms of error are, um, they're summarizing accuracy across all the different families. And so some families may manifest more varied accuracy than others. That might matter if you care about something in particular. Maybe you care about butyrate production. Um, this analysis was based on described gene families. And genes from novel families, which are almost certainly going to exist in your metagenome, may behave differently. Maybe some of the reasons that we have a hard time annotating those genes is because they look differently. Um, they might use alternative start codons, for example, even though these gene prediction tools tend to implement the known alternative start codons. Um, and then I also think it's important to note that there remains error in this approach even when six frame translation and relatively long sequences are implemented. Right? So it's hard to get a bulletproof precise estimate of relative abundance error um, using this approach, but it gets you in the ballpark of being something that's relatively accurate. So then how do we determine if a predicted peptide belongs to a family? Well, we can use, um, as I've noted already, uh, we're going to use pairwise sequence alignment to determine homology. Based upon the alignment score or some other threshold, E value, whatever you choose, you're going you're gonna to classify a predicted peptide into a family. So what threshold should we select? Should we just pull something out of the bag? Or should we think about it from, through a statistically guided framework? Well, what we did is we assessed how um, different classification thresholds, here we just used the alignment bit score. We assessed how different classification thresholds of homology affect the overall results of functional imputation accuracy that you obtain. And what we find is a little concerning. There is actually a pretty sensitive um, uh, re response in the curve as we increase the classification bit score, meaning that your alignment has to have a really high score over on this end of the plot for your sequence to be determined to be a member of the family. And you're basically letting just about everything in the front door um, down on this end of the plot. 
there tends to be a really sensitive response in terms of the relative accuracy of relative abundance error that you end up producing. But fortunately for us, this response is a function of read length. As we increase read lengths, we tend to find that the threshold, though it still has an optimum value, um, tends to be a little more robust to whatever specific threshold you end up selecting. But the point is, we have to think about this. And we have to apply thresholds, um, if we want to select the optimum, that are read length specific. The optimum threshold for uh, a 150 base pair read, for example, is different from the optimum threshold for a 50 base pair read. Question. Yeah. You're right, there's a trade-off there. The false discoveries basically go down as you increase the threshold. So, you know, I'm, I, I don't want to get on a soapbox and say you should definitely use this particular threshold because it probably comes down to the analytical objectives that you have at hand. Do you want to be really conservative or really permissive? The point that I want to make to you today is simply that where you are on that spectrum of discovery um, needs to be considerate of the specific threshold that you implement. Now, one thing that we're really only beginning to stumble into is that these patterns are probably also reference database specific. The reason I think we see a lot of these patterns is because of collisions and homology between different families. And some protein family databases are going to have families that are much more distinct and discrete, so your classification will be much more um, precise as a result. Okay, so um, just to summarize, optimal thresholds likely vary across families. Um, it is a, a point that reiterates the caveat that we saw on uh, the gene prediction. Assembled data may manifest varied sequence lengths because assembled data will produce um, contigs that are, are of varying sequence length. And so that might be something that has to be considered in the actual alignment, um, uh, excuse me, the homology inference stage. Um, technologically, we appear to be approaching sequence lengths that are less sensitive to threshold selection. So maybe this is not something that really um, requires me to stand up and talk to you about it today. But I think until um, we're, we, we start getting into these long read technologies that are more common, uh, this, is still, this is still something on the table that has to be considered. And then the, the last thing I'll say here is that this annotation strategy is agnostic to how genes are linked into genomes. We're not saying that this gene is a member or is in this E. coli strain. We're just saying that the microbiome has a certain abundance of this gene in particular, and then you can conduct downstream statistics to impute if that gene family relates to your ecological covariant. Well, what about efficiency? Well, as it turns out, um, we can also simulate the number of reads that we're comparing or assessing, and we can then discern how the accuracy of our overarching um, test uh, summary statistic varies as a function of the number of reads that we interrogate. So oftentimes what we're interested in doing is determining how many different types of protein families are encoded in a metagenome, known as the alpha diversity. And what you see here on the plot is as you sequence more reads, the error in terms of the total, your estimate of the total number of protein families present begins to exponentially decrease. Somewhere around a million reads, you could make the argument, um, you start to get pretty reasonable estimates of that, um, that number. We might also be interested in determining how the, uh, the, the, functional, the profile of functional capacity between two samples um, varies as a function of read length. If I want to know if the beta diversity of functions, the kinds of functions you have in your microbiome, do they look very different from the kinds of functions I have in my microbiome, and I'll use a dissimilarity statistic like Bray-Curtis dissimilarity to measure how similar, how related the functional diversity profiles of our microbiomes happen to be. And what you see in this particular plot is on the x-axis the true distance between every pair of samples, and on the y-axis the predicted distance between every pair of samples. And when you sequence a greater number of reads, you end up approaching this y equals x line, which is the ideal. Things that are really far apart in truth, you want them to be really far apart in the predicted metagenomic data that you're looking at. So again, somewhere around a million reads, you start to get a pretty reasonable estimate of the dissimilarity between the functional diversities of the, the metagenomes. This suggests that for these types of questions, we might be able to get away with less data than we initially might think. But if you're interested in chasing, again, a specific protein family, you're probably going to need a sufficient depth of sequencing that you can trust the abundance estimate that you've got for that family.
If it's very rare, you're going to need more data to, to accurately measure it. So after considering these pain points, what have we learned? Well, one, have we sh should we assemble the data or not? Well, you don't have to. You can get a reasonable estimate without doing any sort of assembly on your metagenome if you apply this homology-based inference approach. But doing so might improve your accuracy because you get longer reads and more sequence allows you to have more accurate inferences when you're conducting both the gene prediction and the classification step. How should we translate late reads into protein sequences? Well, we tend to like Prodigal. We think that for Illumina-based sequencing platforms, Prodigal does a very good job, and it massively decreases the amount of sequence information that you have to consider. That vastly improves the throughput of your analysis. And what parameters should we adopt to discern homology? Well, it's, it, it's at least important that we assess the appropriate alignment score thresholds for our analyses, and there are probably other parameters that we could discuss at length as well if you're interested in it. But this is definitely something that should be um, intimately considered and not just pulled out of a hat. And then how can we do this efficiently? Well, in addition to leveraging fast blast tools like Diamond or Rap Search 2, you might appropriately control for the sequencing depth in your analysis depending on the specific question you have in mind. Now, maybe it sounds like it'd be a really bad day in the office to have to do all these different steps independently. I know it did to me when I first started doing this. So we created a workflow that basically automates this entire procedure, starting with unassembled raw metagenomic data in a protein family database of your choice, conducts this entire process. You can optionally use a cloud um, computing um, platform for the component of the workflow that is really computationally rigorous. And at the end of the day, what it will give you are not only classifications for each and every sequence and what family it belongs to, but it will output useful summary statistics the most useful one, of course, is the family abundances for um, every single protein family in your sample of interest. Um, ShotMap is actually just one of several excellent tools that are on the market. I'm not here to shield my own stuff. Um, Human2, MGRAST, um, and Megan also apply really similar procedures. I will say that Human2, which is coming out of Curtis Huttenhauer's lab, looks to be stellar. It will probably be um, the standard fair approach, in my opinion, given some really interesting uh, bells and whistles that they're adding into the infrastructure. And so you should keep an eye out for the publication uh, when it gets launched. We have a little bit of time. I want to leave some time for questions, though. Um, it, so I don't know if there's any discussion on quality control of metagenomic data coming out, um, but maybe I'll just very quickly blast through a couple of considerations that you should think about um, from a practical perspective. And then um, we can end this and, and uh, I, I can field some questions. Um, the, so everything I've described basically assumes that you have high quality metagenomic data, right? And that's a nice ideal, but the, the reality is it's really messy when you get it back from your sequencing facility. Um, your reads will contain sequencing adapters, the Illumina adapters that are used to configure your actual DNA templates onto the flow cell. It will also contain sequencing errors because it, see, DNA sequencing is an imprecise process. We can clean these um, errors up by filtering out reads and trimming off adapters using tools like Trimomatic, FastQ, MCF, and PrintSeq. If you're working with a metagenome that's associated with some sort of host, like a plant, human stool, you know, after lunch, a lovely thing to think about, anything that's coming off of a host, well, you, you probably don't want to include the host's genomic data in your analysis. And if you just take a metagenome, that comes from a host and you start processing the data, you absolutely will get host genomic sequences. And that can contaminate your analysis in effect. And so um, you can use a tool like Bowtie or BM Tagger to compare all of your reads to the host's genome, assuming that you have it, and anything that matches with high fidelity, you get rid of because it's probably host derived, not from the microbiome. And then you might have duplicated sequences. And this is arguably an error. Some people assert that it's not. I haven't really come down on the fence myself. But sometimes, um, due to how library construction takes place, some sequences might be generated multiple times. And that could be an error. Um, and you may not want to have these duplicated sequences affect the, um, the calculation of a family's abundance in your data, because it could be spurious. All these different data features can introduce noise or bias to impact your analysis. So um, the Human Microbiome Project came up with a really nice workflow for quality controlling metagenomic data when, it was, when, it, uh, when the project came online. And basically it works thusly. You take your raw reads and first you trim and you quality filter that data. Get rid of the adapters, get rid of the low quality sequences. Take what, uh, res um, what res remains and compare it to your host genome optionally. You may not be working in a host 
associated community. Get rid of the DNA sequences that are clearly derived from the host. And then you can conduct a dereplication step using some of the tools that I mentioned previously. At the end of the day, you finally got cleaned reads. Um, to make everyone's life a little bit easier, we recently um, produced Shot Cleaner, which is a tool that it's basically a workflow that wraps a variety of these functions that I mentioned previously. Um, and you can plug your raw metagenomic data into the workflow to produce uh, clean data at the end of the day. So I'm going to, uh, for the sake of time, skip a, uh, a, a discussion on how we might analyze these data. I figured this would be optional. Um, but it's something that I just really want to quickly point out to those of you who are thinking about analyzing protein family data. It is not normally distributed. You'll note the zero inflation. Like OTU data, if you've ever worked with that, it's sparse. Many protein families are not commonly represented across samples. So using normal distributions in your statistical modeling is going to get you into trouble. And um, you can take a look at my slides, which I'll make available. I point you to a couple of papers that implement robust statistical procedures that can allow you um, to more accurately and reasonably impute associations between your um, protein family predicted capacities and environmental covariates that you're interested in. The last thing that I'll say is I'll just like to return to this topic of Crohn's disease. I showed you earlier lipid polysaccharide biosynthesis and gag degradation. Well, once, once, one thing that's interesting is if you start applying these types of procedures across a litany of different data sets, you might start to see these common trends emerge and you can learn a lot about what functions might be relevant to shaping the environmental context of your system, or at least interacting with it. As it turns out, when we look across metagenomes from a variety of clinical populations, LPS biosynthesis is not unique to Crohn's disease. It's a common marker of, of um, disease for a variety of different diseases. Whereas gag degradation appears to only be a marker of disease in Crohn's disease. And so one thing I would urge you all to think about as you're beginning to analyze metagenomic data, if that's the route that you take, is to think about integrating a variety of different system level contexts to get a better sense of what types of markers might be more or less appropriate for your environmental covariate of interest. So what did we learn about today? Well, you can study microbiome function to obtain insight into how the microbiome interfaces with its environment. Annotation by homology can, is one way that can provide this insight. Um, there are some heuristics that can speed up annotation, like gene prediction, fast blast procedures, sequencing less reads, um, while maintaining accuracy. But you want to be considerate of thresholding decisions. And then um, finally, I'll just note that uh, metagenome data quality control and um, statistical analysis needs to also be carefully considered. I'd just like to thank um, the organizers of what is clearly an excellent workshop. I hope you're all having a fun time. I have not been here very long, but I think it's, this is a fantastic resource for trainees to have access to. And I thank them for inviting me to come and speak with you today. Um, I'm at OSU. I collaborate with some folks over at the Gladstone Institutes from time to time. Um, and we're thankful to some funding agencies who basically allowed us to conduct the analyses that I've, I shared with you today. I hope it was helpful. Yes. Yeah, so I think those are, uh, first, thank you for the compliment. Um, and uh, second, I think those are great suggestions, and we're thinking along the same lines. Um, we actually think that resources should adaptively um, adopt um, thresholding decisions based upon uh, what type of family we're evaluating, how long the sequence happens to be, et, et cetera. Um, and so as we continue to innovate, um, we, we think that these sort of adaptive thresholding procedures uh, will make their way to the, to the front. All right, thank you very much.